And we should be live there, Rupert. Thanks for joining us again. How are you today? I'm you look good. cold. Huh? <laughs> you look cold. Wrapped up. What country are you in? Huh? What country are you in? Iceland, Steve. Iceland. <laughs> So, oh, yeah, hi everyone, Rupert's, um, Rupert from Kitbag Coaching has joined us again um, on the Perfect Balance Health Experts show. So, um, true to form, we're running late due to technical problems again, so sorry about that. Um, but we will um, try and start on time and hopefully bring you some great information with regards to how to improve your backhand slice today so we're going to talk a little bit about um, a couple of key points key teaching points from Rupert's perspective with regards to the backhand slice um, and we're going to talk about the risk of injury with regards to the backhand slice and where we see most of those type of injuries uh, with people doing dodgy technique um, or just making very big mistakes um, that they can easily put right with the help of a good quality coach so Rupert tell me what you've been up to today uh, well, I'm not coaching, sadly. Still on lockdown. So that's a big uh, well, problem, isn't it, for tennis coaches? The the situation with COVID and uh, non-tennis activities. Exactly. Can't get on court. But, um, yeah, it's keeping ourselves busy with the website and things. So it's always something you can be doing. Um, but yeah, no, all, all good at mind. So what's, your, what's the situation with the tennis club and the tennis? Because you coach at um, Ellisweet Tennis Club in Harpenden, don't you? Yeah, so at the moment, as as most places, I think we are we're completely shut um, for obvious reasons um, for the foreseeable future. So I'm, I'm not sure what's going to happen there. Yeah. Um, over the next few weeks, but but yeah, close at the moment. So in terms of your kind of clients and stuff, obviously they they are uh, clearly they're not playing tennis at the moment, right? Um, some are d doing some stuff from home, um, but but only a few. Uh, a lot of people, I think, have, have sort of bitten the bullet and sort of accepted that they might not have their usual uh, routine. Um, I think that goes for a lot of sports, a lot of, you know, a lot of sessions that we sort of take for granted usually where we're able to just go out and, and get on with it. So, um, but yeah, some people have been looking at looking at ways of, of playing tennis at home, which is awesome. So yeah. um, that's really exciting. And, you know, we're doing some really fun sessions there, aren't we? So. That's really cool. So you're actually running some sessions for us, aren't you? But um, more importantly, you've got your you've launched your kit bag coaching product, haven't you? Which we can talk about later. We, we will. We will we talk will about it later. Great. These are available so, as well. <laughs> Rupert, one of the one of the packages you've got inside the kit bag coaching um, platform is the teaching people about the backhand slice, isn't it? So we've got some examples later on about uh, like key points and key players and what they're doing with their backhand slice that might be different. Um, what, what do you think the key thing is, key mistakes that people make with their backhand slice that they're going to be able to learn by the end of this session? And we'll leave people with your top three tips, won't we? Uh, top three would be uh, don't, we'll tell them at, don't Tell them at the end. Make them, make right. them hang on. All right. Keep, well, there's keep one them hanging thing. on, I think. What do, you see, what do you think the key things are that people go wrong with their backhand slice that you see? Um, oh, they're going to tie into my three key things to uh, tell them. Well, they something. might not. You never know. Uh, I might throw them a little red herring. Um, uh, most, some of the most common things they go that go wrong. Um, I think people see it as a, almost like a cop out shot. They see it as a um, like a, a almost like a what's the word? A defensive. Like after, almost like an afterthought. Right? They don't um, maybe show the respect that it, it it's, a, it's a shot. You know, it's a shot as good as uh, as our top spin uh, ground strokes. And you know, for a long time, uh, it was the main shot. You know, back back if you go back in history. So um, I think it needs to be hit. You know, and, and respected in terms of the technique, um, as you would a top spin shot or a volley or a serve. So don't just sort of think of it. Oh, it's a slice. I'll just swipe my racket at the ball. Um, a couple of misconceptions, I think, with the slice, definitely with the technique, uh, which we'll go over. We've got a really good video that shows that nice and clearly, and I'll, I'll explain that as best I can. Um, but it's, it's, it's a massive uh, sort of misconception, um, I think, from a lot of players. So a lot of players who play quite a good level will probably not even realise that this is actually a fundamental part of the technique. Um, 
other things with the slice people maybe the way they hit it so sort of floating it too high um Obviously, if you're under pressure and you're defending, then height is your friend. Height is a good thing because you want to buy yourself time uh, to recover. So whether that's singles or doubles, but if you're not in a, in a sort of high pressure situation where you are under pressure yourself, you don't really want to be putting that ball too high because um, obviously you're just giving your opponent too much time. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, obviously if it's doubles that you've got that player at the net poaching, so they've got more chance of getting your shot. So, yeah. yeah. So it's interesting you mentioned about the history of the backhands and the backhand slice in particular. And I remember when I first started playing tennis back in the day and uh, we were, um, one of the pinups was uh, Steffi Graf. Do you remember Steffi? So Steph, Steffi Graf used to have an amazing, amazing backhand slice. It was pretty much the, the, the shot, her shot, wasn't it? Yeah. But literally ev everything was sliced. It was amazing. That was that was the era, you know. So then it went yeah. a volley, and then you've got your your big baseliners, and now it's going back towards towards serving. I mean, if you look at the average rally length over the years, it's just gone down and down, um, and the ace count has, has gone up and up. So yeah, you know, players like Anderson, um, team those guys with the, with the huge serves. Um, so it's it's I mean it's ever changing, right? That's why we that's why we love it. It's a, everyone's yeah. got their flair, their style, but also the sport as a whole is, is always evolving. So, um, yeah, it just just like, I mean back in that era, and I can't remember if he did, but Edberg I seem to remember had a, a pretty mean backhand slice as well as Sampras. He was pretty famous for his backhand slice as well. So these kind of top pinup tennis players, males and females, were quite renowned for. Uh, particular shots but one of the ones that stood out was this kind of low backhand slice that they all used to hit yeah yeah so of course i mean when the rackets obviously have evolved as well and this is a massive part of why the game's changed but um yeah. you mentioned like sampras there obviously once you know through through the 90s and stuff the, the rackets were getting more powerful and all those sort of things that top spin was a much bigger player um so obviously te techniques changed yeah, change over time because of d different sort of um, variables. But uh, but yeah, no, it's interesting. So do you think the speed of the games had a lot to do with the reduction in the amount of backhand slices hit? Because it does take a bit of time to prepare for that shot, doesn't it? It's not like a a forehand or sorry, a backhand, a normal backhand single, double hand backhand. It's going to take a little bit more time to set yourself up and get your body in the right position to be able to hit it correctly. It can, um, and it kind of depends. I mean, you can obviously hit with a stunted take back if you're under pressure, but yeah. um, in terms of why they don't use it as much, I'd, I'd say, you know, just learning about the, the sort of the science behind topspin, right? And the way if you, you know, really rip up that ball, that ball's going to go in regardless of how hard you hit it. You know, the, yeah. the faster racket you have, so the more racket head speed you have, the more spin you're generating, right? If you look at a player like Nadal, um, Ferrer, all those Spanish guys, all the guys um, who play clay court, you know, um, the revolutions on the ball is crazy. I can't remember the stats on what Nadal used to hit, but they worked out his RPM and the ball was, you know, doing something stupid like 4,000 revolutions per minute or something crazy. Um, so, and obviously, as you know, that ball, that makes the ball dip. So I think learning about that, it, it was almost a no brainer, right? Um, obviously, there's a time and a place for the slice. I love it. I use it a lot. Um, I think one-handed backhand players probably do depend on it a bit more. Um, but, you know, in itself, it is, it is still the right shot in certain situations. So, obviously, decision-making and shot selection comes into it a lot more um, when you've got those different shots to hit. Whereas, like we said, back in the day, that's probably the main shot. Um, yeah. But, yeah, now you've got more options. It's, it's sort of the, the, the decision-making behind choosing which shot to hit is a massive part of the game as well. So, yeah. That's probably something quite good to uh, just annotate on our board here. So we've got, um, I guess, with the with the ability to be able to hit the ball harder, you've got the evolution of that, that slice. If we've got our tennis balls and you've got one one that's travelling over the net with... So a backhand's going to typically... A, a slice in general is typically going to travel lower over the net, right? Um, I mean, if it travels higher, they're going to have to hit it slower to allow it to drop. Obviously, yeah, yeah. with slice, the ball is only really going to start dropping once it slows down enough for gravity to take effect. So yeah. um, if you hit too high and hard with a slice, yeah, the ball's going to go soaring out the back of the court. So um, you're right. If you're trying to hit an aggressive slice, definitely you've got to be coming sort of um, 
down to the ball. Yeah. Keep it low over the net. So I guess in terms of the physics of actually what's happening there, if you've got the wind resistance or the air resistance very game. Technical. Huh? Very technical. This is very it's technical. technical, mate. It's got to be technical. This is this is where most of the injuries come from. Because you've got you've got a situation here where you can hit the ball harder with the top spin. If you hit the ball harder with a slice, the ball's just going to go sailing out the back, right? Correct. So it's never this ball. This ball is never going to go down unless you really you've got a lot of underspin there to actually slow it down. So you get much more control, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. What What else? You You obviously can't hit the ball as hard with this ball here. So this, the trajectory of this ball over the net is going to be travelling like this and be able to dip down quite quickly Correct. because the physics, the physics are going to be such that it's going to actually like bring it down a lot quicker onto the ground. Yeah. Whereas this ball you're going to get is going to be more of a floating ball Correct. over the net. So it's going to go, you're going to be able to get those deeper shots So you're not, or, or shorter shots where you're actually underspinning it and going for the drop shot. So... Yeah. You really want to get that kind of trajectory over the net. Sorry, my net would be here. <laughs> Forgot the technical bits in my excitement to explain some physics about tennis ball mechanics. Well. I and guess that's, that's it's quite an interesting um, like mechanical understanding of how the ball's travelling over the net. So I guess that, that shapes up how you want to use the backhand slice in a game or a topspin. Slice and in, in sorry, top spin in a, in a top of spin backhand in a game, right? I mean, massively. And like we said, obviously, it depends if you're playing singles or doubles. Using a slice in doubles is always risky because typically, yeah. it, you know, you're going to be hitting it Slow. slower, yeah, or low. But it, if you're hitting a, a really fast slice, um, you know, you're aiming only a few inches over the net. Obviously, your margins are so fine. You've got to be a very, very, very good player, even to be getting a sort of you know low to medium consistency. Um, yeah. I don't think anyone's going to be getting a high consistency hitting an aggressive slice down a few inches over the net, uh, even at you know your highest of club levels um, when you've got someone at the net ready to pounce. You know, so um, yeah, I think definitely in singles it's it's a shot that's used more. Again, on grass court it's used more, um, and it can be used. Uh, you know, it can be used as an aggressive shot. We shouldn't forget that. So it's a like shot I like. A lot, yeah. If I'm approaching the net off a lower ball, so I'll always yeah. approach with a slice. Um, but do you, do you think uh, that because it gives you more time to get into the net, though? It's 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 that I'm still hitting it quite aggressively, but it's because it stays yeah. low. So when I'm at the net, their next shot, they can't really hit a passing shot because for them to hit a passing shot, similar to what we were speaking about with the slice, they've got to pick it up off the ground to be able to hit that they, shot, right? They've got to hit the ball up over the net, right? And if they've got to hit the yeah. ball up, then they've either got to put a lot of spin on it. You come in it to take it, yeah. Like that, or they've got to slow it down. Yeah. They cannot hit hard and flat. You know, they might be able to slap it and hope and, you know, one in a hundred, you get one of those freak, almost like a squash shot that yeah. does go over. But, um, you know, tennis, as we know, is a game of statistics. So more often than not, if you approach with that slice, keep the ball below the height of the net quite considerably, you know, then they're picking that ball up from below, below sort of knee height. And um, like I say, the ball is going to be a much easier volley for you to finish off. So, um, yeah. There are times when you would use it aggressively. Um, also, some players just struggle with a low ball, you know. So, like on our on our serve, where we always, you know, or I would always say to try and target the player's weakness if there is an obvious weakness. Um, with a slice, if a player really struggles with a low ball, uh, maybe someone's got a dodgy hip at your club or whatever, you know, exploit it. All right, we're there to win, aren't we? So, um, you know, so you can always there are always sort of times to use certain shots. Uh, like we said, but yeah, don't yeah. think of the slice just as a defensive shot because it definitely isn't. Yeah, I, I, guess, I guess the context of which you use it in is very important. So it's um, using it at the right time. Ex yeah, exactly. Like we said, shot selection and decision making. In obviously, you know, not only which shot you're hitting, but where you're hitting it. I mean, this is getting a bit um, sort of tactical now, but it's definitely worth remembering. Um, in choosing the, the the shot to hit, you've got to think about you know the situation you're in and, and what you're trying yeah. to do with that. Yeah. You've so you have that have that idea in your head of what you're trying to do to then choose the shot. Yeah. Um, Inside your kit bag coaching like solution, you you have technical elements as well as tactical, don't you? So it's not just all about hitting the slice; it's about understanding when to use that, right? 
yeah, so there's tactical components, there's, there are ta um, sort of tactical courses. Um, and the way I teach, obviously, if something needs, if something's transferable and we're talking about a technique uh, and it links into a tactic, then obviously we'll, we'll, we'll talk about it. Um, and sort of go, go off on a bit of a tangent just to just if it's relatable. Um, but then, yeah, but back to the topic. But there we've got dedicated courses on tactical play. So um, because, you know, at the end of the day, I, I'm not a fan of people that say at the end of the day, it doesn't matter how it's done as long as you win, because long term, you're not going to be improving. You should play to improve, not only to win, but also injury wise. That's one of the, you know, the biggest causes of injury, as I'm sure you'll, you'll be aware of in your line of work. So if you get people who, who just focus on the outcome um, and they go, yeah, but it worked. And it's like, yep, it worked, but you are tearing your shoulders to shreds or you could be doing it in a more efficient way. So it's like, you know, it's it's a balance, isn't it, of what yeah. you're trying to do and then doing it in a way in which works, uh, not only efficiently, but also so you don't get injured. So, um, yeah, balance it's always that constant balance uh, between technique and tactics. Yeah. Where, where do you think games are won and lost? Do you think it's more technical or tactical? <sighs> Again, I mean, you've got, you could throw anomalies in there, like if a player goes off injured because of poor technique, you know? Um, yeah. wouldn't happen so much at pro level but but uh, you know a club if someone's got poor technique and they're, or they're moving in a poor manner and they roll their ankle for, for some reason that's essentially a result of, of bad technique um, tactics I think in general you would say tactics um, and then you've got to look at those tactics and they were obviously maybe hitting the ball in a way in which they could have hit it better yeah. but usually I'd say tactics are the actual cause of most people's um defeat so if you lose a match it's usually because of how you played the points rather than how you actually executed the shots but obviously like yeah. i said it, without seeing that specific case it's, it's a balance so um you think in um cause obviously playing tennis myself it's into you get into these um if you tactically if you're not playing the right game then technically you end up hitting the wrong shots as a result of that because you've just not got enough time or move towards the ball quick enough because you tactically you're not playing the right game right definitely you know, it's yeah definitely it's something that could be affected by your opponent as well right so you get yeah. the sort of players that chisel it back um don't apply any sort of pressure they give you a slow ball and you end up having to there's a classic example right so the amount of players i coach who come to me and say look i'm fine at the baseline i'm fine returning serve i can do everything but someone gives me a slow ball and I, I miss it every single time. And it's such a common one at club level. So, you know, even some top, top players. I mean, I watch our men's first team play, right? We play matches and guys who you see absolutely, you know, smashing the ball backwards and forwards um, to a really good level. Fantastic serves, you know, 100 mile an hour plus serves, you know, great touch at the net. But again, a slow ball comes over and the ball stops dead mid-court and they'll miss the ball. Um, so again, if someone plays that tactic upon you, you know, giving you a lot of slow balls, you've got to adjust. Um, and then it links into tactic, uh, sorry, technique. Which yeah. the, their tactic there of, of sort of um, giving you that sort of the, the chiseled ball. You've then got to learn how to generate the power yourself because that's why you're missing the ball. If there's no pace on the ball and you're missing nine times out of 10, because you're not able to generate the power in a controlled way. So, um, but they always look easy, but that's one of the hardest situations to, to deal with. But yeah, the tactic always links to a technique. Um, that's that's cool. So we're going to have a look at some of the um, top players, won't we? We've yeah, got Mr. Mr. Federer is joining us tonight again. We just, I mean, we will stop using him eventually. I promise. We'll use you, Steve. We'll, we'll and rip me apart. Him. Rip it. Huh? Rip it apart. Right, am I sharing? Yeah, you can. Here we go. Can you see? Uh, yeah, brilliant. Perfect. So, we're going to look at Roger's backhand slice here. Um, so, we'll click play. We'll just watch a few to start with. So, I mean, obviously, you know, like with his backhand the other day, he, he does make it look... Uh, very easy right but that can't be taken for granted he wasn't just born um, into this weird person it is 
through good technique and like we spoke about last time sort of you know huge sort of flexibility conditioning um which enables him to look so sort of graceful on court and it is you know it is amazing to watch um but yeah don't don't take that for granted there's a lot of work that goes into this so first sure thing we need to not sure if that's playing Rupert is it not playing at your end no just a dead screen brilliant I was do you like my chat though so let's go. Can you see that? I can see it, it's just not playing. Can you see it now playing? There we go. If you make it full screen, then we can all see it. it will, all right, I tried to do that first. Can you see it now? Uh, it seems to cut off when you go full screen for some reason. Should we just keep it on? Here we go. Yeah, there you go. That seems to be working. Okay, so uh, if we look at his setup, first of all, So you can see as he's moved to the ball, he's initiated like a full sort of shoulder turn. Um, and that right hand is very, very high. So you can see his hand's actually above his shoulder. Um, and the other thing to note here is the left hand is still on the racket. Now, this is one of the most common things we see um, with backhand volley, with one-handed backhand players, um, when hitting top spin and then, you know, any player hitting a one-handed backhand slice. I think they, because we think of it as a one-handed shot, a lot of players get into that trap of releasing the left hand too early, you know, far beyond this point. Um, so they'll probably actually be releasing it about here. Now that's what you don't want to be doing. Cause as soon as that left hand releases, the right arm's completely isolated um, with the racket in it. So it can basically do whatever it likes. While he's got his left hand still on the racket here, he's locked in position. So his whole upper body is working as a unit. You can see it's pretty much just left there. And now if we look at the path of that racket, so he's coming down towards the ball. And you can see there, so we're going to play that one again. So again, look where that left hand so is still on, still on, still on. And then it releases as he starts to accelerate to the ball. Um, now this time what I'm going to try and watch I'll try and pause at the right time is his contact point now this is again a massive sort of misconception I think there that on contact the racket face should be open um, now as you contact a slice all right, for it to work your racket face is ever so slightly open by open, guys, all we mean is pointing upwards slightly. So when the string string bed is pointing up, that's open. When it's pointing down, that's closed. Um, now, most people think with a slice, your racket angle should be... Uh, right, I'm going to try and draw, see what happens. Could go horribly wrong. Um, racket angle should be... Open. So most people think that racket angle should be like this. Do you see that, Steve? Yep. Very good. Um, but if his racket angle was this open, the ball is only going to go one way, and that is up in the air. All right, so for him to get that ball to go anywhere near to sort of straight over the net with a little bit of height, which is where he obviously wants the ball to go, that's meant to be an arrow, let's ignore that, um, then he's got to keep the strings pretty much pointing forwards on contact. All right, so that's definitely one to remember, guys, is, is keep the strings pretty much pointing forwards on contact. Um, rather so what, than... What causes the underspin, Rupert, is not so much the racket angle, it's the, the, the decline of the from the high to low trajectory of the racket face. Exactly, Steve, yeah. So we'll watch a few, um, just so we can sort of... I'll let them play through, so I'm not going to stop it. But yeah, you're, you're exactly right. Um a similar way of thinking about it is with a topspin forehand, ex exactly the same problem. People think the racket face needs to be, you know, angled down. Um, now, that's not necessarily incorrect. I'm not saying that, you know, I'm not saying it, it isn't, but it's very, very subtle. And this is what people get wrong. Um, it should be very subtle. So um, it, it, you can almost think of it as pointing forwards. You know, if you think of a, a topspin shot that you want the strings pointing down, you're going to hit the net nine times out of ten. Same with the slice. If you think of it that you want the strings pointing up on contact, you're going to be sending that ball sky high. Um, so we've got a different angle here. So we'll see what it looks like from here. You probably won't see that angle so much. You'll see a really nice setup though. So you can see he's pretty side on before the shot. 
Um, and that's the last thing I'll say is after the shot, we'll watch a few more. I'm just going to go back to this view for you. So if you watch when he one, finishes... One, one thing with Federer that's quite consistent is all of his shots, he's he's not like... A, do you remember Pete Sampras? He's probably a bit, bit um, yeah. before your time, but he My was... First um, Sampras racket. Sorry? My first racket was a Pete Sampras racket. Yeah, me too. Small head? Small head. Small head. That's the one, mate. It's the stuff dreams are made of. So um, one of the things that's different, because Sam Press, when I, I saw uh, Federer last year, junior Wimbledon, um, 18. So it's quite interesting watching him because he did emulate uh, Sam Press quite a lot in terms of his movement, didn't he? But he's, he's definitely changed as years have gone by to develop his own style that's now very different to where he started from. If you look at Federer now compared to Federer like when he was 18, the big difference in terms of technical ability, don't you think? Uh, yeah, yeah. And also, you know, the way he's adapted to uh, almost align with his physicality, right, and his age. So even smaller things like he's obviously standing further forwards now, to take the ball earlier, so he's got to move yeah. less at the baseline, right? So he's cutting the angles down a lot. Um, he went through that phase a few years ago where he was returning serve well inside the baseline, um, you know, which you can still see in his game. So he, he's... Where possible, he's, he's cutting down the movement. He's cutting down the amount of movement he's having to do. Um, I mean, he's one of only a handful of players, I would say, has got the technical ability to be able, and the timing to be able to do that and hit the ball so consistently yeah. um, on the rise so often. Or off, yeah. You know, the, the balls he's receiving from those guys, you know, teams forehand, um, Djokovic's returns back to his feet. It's, it's crazy what's, what's yeah. out there at the moment. They're animals. Um, I think he, but, I think what what you can really appreciate with Federer versus someone like myself, for example, or like a beginner, you, you're going to... The, the one thing that I think increases injury risk is if you watch Federer as he moves to the ball. So moves to the ball, move, 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 move. Movement slows down, plants the foot, almost stops, and then regains the movement afterwards. And you can see that happen time and time again with that professional level player that they're not moving and hitting the ball at the same time. They hit the ball and then they speed up their movement to recover back for the next shot. And it's that decision-making is really quite critical, I think, to injuries and like helping prevent injuries. Massively. I mean, you know, you know more than me on this area, but biomechanics is, is obviously a huge part of it. Um, engaging the hips and the glutes and, and the right parts of the body at the right time to get the muscles sort of firing. Yeah. Um, if you're moving, it's, it's almost impossible to even think about those things, let alone make them happen, right? And I'm, yeah. you know, obviously, we be thinking as we're playing. It should be, it should be happening sort of almost subconsciously, automatically, yeah. right? As, as long as we've practiced it enough. But um, your body cannot replicate the movements that, that that it should be if you're still moving as you hit. Yeah. So where possible, you will always see the pro, you know the pros obviously planting those feet. Sometimes it's unavoidable. Uh, when you're under pressure. Um, just yeah. one more thing I was going to mention while we're on this um, is if you just watch as he finishes, his chest is pretty much still facing towards the camera. So he'll obviously come through slightly, yeah. um, but not going to rotate much at all. So if you look at that position there, his left arm has come back uh, to sort of counter the rotation. Yeah. See, his the, the thing is, I think with that, it's a, it's a bit of a, a fedism, I call it. Uh, the reason it's a fedism is because shoulders are so flexible. There's not many people on the planet that could do that. If you look at how much uh, extension he gets in his right side. So there, there, there. And then he comes through and the racket's still going. Watch how open he becomes. It's almost going back for a forehand swing at the end of that. It's a huge take back. Huge. Not many people can do that. No, of course. But you can see from the, the hips as well um, that he hasn't brought this left hip forwards completely. Yeah. So... There's obviously he's allowing his body to move slightly. He just doesn't want to say completely rigid, completely side on. Um, but it, but he's definitely not driving through with the rotation as you would on on a uh, on like a two-handed backhand there. Um, so the fun is there any is there any match play? Because that's on the practice court, isn't it? At um, is that Melbourne? Do you want me to find a video of him playing? Yeah, that'd be good. Where is that? It's Melbourne, is it? Cincinnati. Uh, <laughs>
What's that top 10 poisonous slice? That could do it. This one. Uh, I think higher, higher up. That's it. Federer top 10 poisonous. Is it going to be slow mo? Slices. Oh, he's on clay here. This would be good. Okay, so you see the difference with Federer and who's that he's playing? It's Jock. Djokovic. Yeah. See Djokovic, he has this, he carries his momentum through the ball. If you think, how has Djokovic been injured quite a bit, hasn't he? Uh, he has at times. I mean, so you can see when's the last time Federer got injured? No, I can't remember any serious injuries. Um, I yeah. Mean, I don't remember any injuries for Federer at all, or well, none that he's uh, broadcasted. No, it's incredible. And again, you've got his hip. You've got his hip problem. He's had that elbow problem for a while. Yeah, I mean, you look at some players, Del, Del Potro and stuff, and I think personally, my opinion on that is, you know, you're going to, and Del Potro is my favourite player, right? I will say yeah. So, um, but I'll still be completely honest. I think you've got to look at the. You, I mean, you've got to look at the team around them, right? So Federer is obviously doing something right. You don't do this for so long at his level and, and achieve what he's done through luck, you know, or through having the right body. Um, and, you know, I'm not saying Del Potro isn't putting the work in the gym. They all are all the time. But technique-wise, that forehand, um, it's, you know, it's, you, you wouldn't teach it. Let's put it that way. Um, you know, I wouldn't, if someone went, I want Del Potro's forehand, right? <laughs> no chance. Um, <laughs> so... It's the one thing. So that's, a, that's a good example of what we were talking about earlier, wasn't it? Watch the slice. See, sorry. He, he comes in off the back of it. It was a forehand slice. It wasn't a backhand slice, but it stayed low. So the opponent had to hit up, which then allowed him to come in afterwards. So it makes it easier for him. So Less that's... chance of injury. He's going to show it again. There we go. Yeah, exactly. The ball's got to be coming back from that low point. Yeah. So again, yeah. it's mixing. I mean, that was a forehand slice there. It's an unorthodox shot. Um, it's a shot I use. It's a shot I teach. And at the right time, again, it's the right shot. You know, it's like a drop shot. Um, you don't want to overuse it, but yeah. in the right scenario, at the right time, if it's a break point or whatever, and you haven't used one and, and you've got the right ball, then definitely that that's definitely the right option in, the, in that situation. Um. But yeah, no, it's an interesting shot to slice, you know, because it can be, like I say, it can, it's a very versatile shot. And it's the one shot you can almost get away with having pretty much any contact point on. And the reason I say that is because you're only isolating the, the right arm as a right-handed player or left arm as a left-handed player. Uh, you can get away with a lot more. You're not having to rotate. You're not having to use those big muscle groups as much. Um, whereas with a forehand, obviously, if you, you know if your contact point is below like knee height, for example, you know, you'd have to completely adapt how you hit the ball and really use your wrist to, to rip up the back of the ball. If the, if the ball's sort of like head height, it's very difficult to hit a decent shot from up there with topspin. But with a slice, you can come up and around a high ball. You can get down to a low ball. Uh, you know, if that ball's about to bounce twice, you can pick a, a slice up from, you know, an inch above the ground and you can hit an amazingly effective slice still. Um, yeah. So... Yeah, it's very versatile. You can hit off a wide ball if you're under pressure. You can also slice in, you know, when the ball's into your body. So it's a shot Federer uses a lot, like almost like a defensive slice when someone swings a serve into his body. Um, so, yeah, it's, it's a really interesting shot. It's a really interesting shot. I guess that, the, that last shot there, you see, it's using that slice to get the depth. So we talked about that before. Uh, but it's staying low, so it's giving him less time to make that decision. It's also keeping him deep in the core. So yep. effectively, that's a good example of where tactical helps technical um, and also reduces injury risk as well, because the technical ta tactical element means that he's making it easier for himself rather than letting the opponent hit, hit him off the court a lot of the time. Yeah, definitely. And if you make the right decisions in tennis, you know it can be a much easier sport if you make the wrong decisions or you just don't think. You know, when you're training and practicing and, and get trying to get better, if you don't think, then, you know, it becomes a very difficult sport because um, it's only you out there, right? So if you, you know, if you're not thinking, then you haven't got anyone else doing it for you. I think that's the, 
that's the yeah. thing at club level we see the most is, is people getting found out maybe where you know other sports you play football you play netball you play hockey whatever it is you play rugby you've got a team around you right so if yeah. you switch a split second I'm not saying we should you know but we do you see it at pro level you know football and things players switch off but there's someone else there to you know if a defender slips right there's still the goalkeeper to get past with tennis if you, if you, you know, mess it up at a, a sort of crucial point that's the match over that's that's it done and then you've got to reflect on that so um, yeah interesting from that sort of point of view as well the, when the pressure gets to you so It's interesting watching Federer on in clay he's got a very different game to because that, that stillness that he has when he hits the ball, it doesn't translate very well onto clay. What's his match match record like on clay compared to other courts? It's more hard courts he's going to win, right? Yeah, I mean, grass grass and hard court is, is obviously his strongest surface. That's because of his forehand grip as well. He, so he plays with like an eastern grip. Uh, it's quite an old school grip. Um, it's always more old school than... Um, you know, the more you look at players like um, Nadal, sorry, and those Spanish guys using more like a Western forehand grip or like a yeah. strong Western. So um, his grip correlates well with a lower contact point. And obviously you get a lower contact point off. Um, I'm just going to pause this, mate, sorry. Uh, you get a lower contact point off a grass court, um, you know, in particular, yeah. and also on a hard court than a clay court. So, um, and that's why you... you the flip side of that is players like Nadal, Ferrer, you know, um, those guys, the team, they, they love the clay, so. Yeah. No, it's good. Excellent. So, Roops, kit bag coaching, how much better is that going to make people become if they if they buy that product? Well, you've learned already, Steve, so you've only been uh, watching a I've few I've gone up years. a notch. I've gone up a notch. Gone up a notch. Um, I mean, look, I, I, I'm obviously going to, I'm, I'm going to say it's good, but I think that the main thing is that the people that have used it um, have said it's good, right? So that's You've had some good feedback, haven't you, from all ages, which I think has been really encouraging for you. It must be good to see your knowledge translating into juniors as well as adults in terms of what you're able to do with them. Massively, yeah. I mean, I'm not going to be, um, the, you know, I'll admit, I, I actually prefer coaching adults now. So when I was younger, um, 18, sort of 19 coaching, I used to find it a bit more not intimidating, but I used to find it easier to work with kids. Um, I actually prefer coaching adults one-to-one now, maybe because, you know, you can have a conversation during long hours, whatever it is. But with this, it's not the adults, it's the kids as well. They're all loving it. Um, and it's all relatable. And the way we filmed it is all pretty friendly, um, friendly, yet, you know, um, it's got, got a professional side to it so it's not you know um you don't sort of go off topic at all uh, there's no long pauses like there are right now because i'm live with you uh <laughs> i think having used it you know, myself i think the, the the key thing there is um just the diversity so if you're very technical then it's really good because you can break things down but if you're very you want to become an all-rounder you've got that element of the fitness and the coaching around the the tennis rather than just the tactical Sorry, just the technical, and you've also got that tactical element there as well. Which, from my point of view, as a as a um, as an osteopath, it's quite useful to help prevent injuries. Um, Halima just said goodbye to us. She's really enjoyed it. Said it's really interesting. So it's good. Um, awesome. I, was, yeah, I mean, just on that note, I'll say so because um, someone said to me this when I said, "Look, we're we're starting this online coaching," and they said, "Oh, there's loads of that out there." I said, what's your USP? And I said, God, you know, I hadn't thought about it. I haven't had to do a business plan for anyone. Um, it, it's not like that. And I sort of thought, and I went back and I thought, what is it, what is, or what makes us different at least? Um, and the way I would describe it, and, and it's as accurate as I can be, is th- it's almost a collective uh, group of individual lessons condensed into bite-sized videos available as a course. So the reason I say that is when I teach someone, for example, to serve, and they come to me and, and I'll watch it, I'll analyse it. For example, you know, they might not be dropping the racket head low enough, right? So they're holding the racket too tight. Nine times out of 10, that's probably the reason. And you'll work on that for a lesson. And, you know, someone who doesn't play that much, it might take two lessons, but you work on that until it's fixed. And that's the way I coach. And I, that's the, you know, that's my philosophy. That's the way I believe you should do it. I don't think you should be working on six different things in a lesson. I don't think you should be picking a different thing each week. So it's this philosophy of, of working on it until it's fixed and then moving on to the right thing and doing them in the right order. And that's what yeah. we've done with, with Kitbag. And that's why um, the clients 
some that I coached and have used it and they've said, you know, it, it's, it's brilliant. And some that haven't had coaching with me ever before, some people I've not met and they've used the website and given us feedback and they've, they've taken to it as if what, you know, as if I'd already coached them. It was, it was quite strange. So it is that idea of having uh, manageable bite-sized videos, which have all the Im information you need in a very condensed format, very simple, um, and very very easy to digest so yeah no it's, you know the feedback's been great but you know that means nothing until you try it so um on to that note i think our introductory offer is actually sadly due to end tonight uh so Rupert, before you plug yourself mate what are your <laughs> top three tips for people that are going to what what would you say is the top three takeaways for people that want to improve their backhand slice uh, tip one is yep. www.kitbag. No, I'm joking. Uh, tip one is <laughs> <laughs> this guy's a marketing machine. And the course is that. No. Okay, I'll give you. I'll give you four. I'll give you four. I'll give you a bonus. <laughs> one the, and the fourth the cheeky, one is am I kitbag coaching? The cheeky plug. I'll give you four, and I won't mention kitbag again. I'll let you do. Go that. on then. And First no branding one, either. None of none of this. <laughs> So I've got my knee up and relaxed. Uh, first one is it's got to be that contact point that I spoke about. Yeah. So because just because it's such a misconception. Um, and I think, yeah, it, when you watch the other thing is when you watch a, a slow motion slice or, or sorry, a normal speed slice, you don't see it because it's a very quick movement of the wrist. Right. And it's something that you have to adapt to over time and get used to. So um, that's definitely the first thing is be aware of that. And just be conscious of that when you hit your slices, think about having that having that racket face pointing forwards rather than pointing yeah. up in the air. Yeah. Um, second thing so would me, be... If I can just make a point on that one. Uh, from an injury point of view, um, that's a very difficult thing to do. So actually working on your forearm strength is a key component to helping prevent the injuries there as well. And very difficult to be able to keep the racket face flat as you come through the ball. Um, so you've got to work on those extensors in particular, doing the band exercises and the uh, small dumbbell resistance exercises as well. Next one. Um, what was the next? You've thrown me. You've, I was so interested in your chat about the forearm. Um, okay, next one's got to be, uh, duh, 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 what do we say? Oh, staying side on, not rotating too much. All right, so not, you don't want to be coming round on the finish. Remember, opening the body up too much. Um, think of it that you're isolating the arm. Third thing is... So for me, just on, on that note, um, don't forget what you're going to say, though, is the, the footwork, leading, your footwork leading up to that position so you can stay side on means you're going to reduce injury and not over-rotate to compensate for the movement, which will cause your back to become injured. So... You've got to be really careful there and make sure that you're getting the footwork right. You ready for me? Go on, then. Got a list. I want to provide value. You just want to sell your product, mate. You're trying to sell your product. I'm trying to trying to kick out the value. You've written it down so you don't forget. Go on. Serious, mate. Um, Go on. What, what, what extra bit of value are you going to provide? We've got two more little golden nuggets of advice. I'm trying to work out which one's more important. They're both important as each other. Um, so the third one is, um, again, a technical thing. So the left hand stays on, remember, until it's time to accelerate. Yeah. Now, this is the same um, for a one-handed backhand as well. Okay, so so many players take the racket back from their ready position. They take the left hand off straight away and they play the whole shot as if it's a one-handed shot. Think of it as a two-handed shot. That's what I would say to you. The rethink, think it's a two-handed shot. Just as I start to accelerate, I'm going to release the hand because the majority of the shot should be with two hands on the racket. So from the ready position through your unit turn to a setup until you're waiting for that ball to be in the right place until you accelerate all that time, you should have two hands on the racket. So think of it as a two handed shot and um, it's got a delivery of snacks. Sorry. Everyone's distracting you. These are healthy. I promise. <laughs> <laughs> I like these live sessions uh, and keep the left hand on for longer. What more can I say, people? Right, the last one. So for me, in terms of injury side of that, uh, you, the reason you want to keep the left hand on, on longer from an injury point of view is it's going to stop overloading that right shoulder or your left shoulder if you're left-handed. But if your racket's not steady and it's going back, you've got to compensate by over-recruiting the rotator cuff. If it's nice and stable and you've got that extra stability through the left hand, 
it's going to stay nice and stable as you come to. You can hit a more effective ball. And um, let's try and put Rupert off so he forgets his fourth one. No, mate, I've written it down. Send me a photo. Um, uh, the last one is respect. I hope you're listening to me. All this, all no. this quality advice I'm giving to you. I've already heard it from you. Oh, no. <laughs> the, the last thing is, and it's the most important thing, respect the slice. So what I mean by that, and I'm not... Respect you know, the I'm slice. Like, You're just making that up. I did ask Steve, I'm going to get some T-shirts made. with Respect the, the, the slice. Hashtag, hashtag, hashtag bag respect on the back. The hashtag respect the slice. <laughs> The reason I say this is because people see it as, like I say, a cop-out option. They cop see out, it as, yeah. you know, they just see it as, oh, it's a slice. I'm just going to flail the racket at, at the ball. And it's not about that. You know, it's it's like we spoke about. It's a fantastic shot um, that if, if learned properly and used properly at the right times, can be a massive weapon as well as a defensive mechanism, uh, both in singles and doubles. So don't think of it just as a defensive shot. Don't think of it as a shot you only hit, you know, when you, you can't get in a position for the two-handed backhand or a one-handed backhand. Um, but on that note as well, I will say it is a very good option uh, because you'll remember earlier I said about your contact point, you have flexibility uh, and a bit more margin for error with the contact point on a slice because yeah. of the nature of it's a more isolated shot with just the right arm doing the work. You can get away with a lower contact, higher contact, wider contact. So I will say... If you feel you're in a position, even after you've tried your best to get in the right position, if you feel you're still in a position where you're not able to get the right contact point for uh, like a topspin driven backhand, um, then it is a good option to use that slice. But again, don't then think I'm just going to, you know, just chop at it. Remember, you want to try and lock that wrist and, and extend through the ball. So it is still a shot that deserves respect. Respect. respect Nothing to slice. say on that. I'm going to respect the slice and I'm going to close my mouth there. That's it. I'm actually gonna I'm gonna rename the course Respect the Slice. Respect the Slice. <laughs> so Rupert, it's your moment of glory. Tell us about well, kickback coaching. The moment, What's happening? The moment the moment's gone now, isn't it? Really? Okay, we'll go then. I've been trying, See you later, guys. For, I've been trying for 45 minutes now to uh, <laughs> I feel like I'm trying to plug a new book on the BBC and they're just shutting me down. <laughs> <laughs> um, no look basically so we've done this introduction we offer over Easter weekend it's gone down really well um, but, but good things have to come to an end sadly so um, the first course on the website was the, was the uh, serve course All right, I think everyone can do with some work on their serve me included we can all improve um, I actually did a free uh, four part ball toss tuition course on Instagram this weekend. I'm about to upload the last part of that. So if you want to have a quick sneak peek at how I teach the ball toss, so you can see if it's, if it's up your street, head over to our Instagram at kitbag coaching. Um, but yeah, if you're interested in, in getting that course for just two pound 80, I mean, that's, it's just nothing these days. Is it really two pound 80? So have a look at that tonight because from midnight that is going to go up. It's still going to be a reduced rate because it's your first course guys, but it's going up to 18 pounds. So um, if you're interested if you haven't quite heard enough of me for tonight, then buy it. You don't have to watch it tonight. Buy it and you can watch it next week. But um, but get in there while, while you can. Um, but yeah, no, it's like I say, I, I'm really passionate about the courses we've created. Um, you know, I know they're good. And if anyone's got any questions um, once you, once you start using the website, then I am always at the end of the phone uh, or an email. So especially while we're currently in lockdown, what's your, what is your email, Rupert? That might be quite it useful to leave people. Rupert, Rupert at kitbagcoaching.com. Uh, and I've got more time than normal at the moment because obviously I'm not on court. So over the next few weeks, uh, while we are still in this lockdown, hopefully not for too much longer, but while we are, um, I will be available for people's sort of basically 24 um, seven sort of Q and A any problems they've got with their technique, um, then I'm happy to, to help those out. Might even do some video analysis stuff on the side. So um, yeah, definitely. If you've got any questions, just sort of run alongside those courses, then then get at me uh, and I will be more than happy to help. Brilliant, yeah. brilliant. We're actually looking for some people to come on live with us uh, to talk about tennis. So on a Monday and a Friday, I think it's tennis talk night, a perfect balance, isn't it? You've got me locked in. Locked in. Locked, I'm not going locked anywhere. in. Well, COVID-19 hey, it's not, it's, it's, style. 
between eight twenty and sometimes about eight forty six. Any time between them, we'll get online. But yeah, well, sometimes but, we we'll get online. We'll be here before nine. <laughs> we'll still be respecting the slice, there, won't we, mate? The late show. <laughs> exactly, the very late show. Anyway, listen, it's been an absolute pleasure to talk to you guys again. Um, thank you very much for staying. Loads of people online tonight, so it's really great to see. And some hopefully some great questions coming for our session on Friday night. Rupert, what are we going to talk about on Friday? I'm not going to pretend um, that, I've, that I've planned Friday session yet. I've been busy away on the website. So I will get on that right now for you, Stephen, and you will be able to tell the people. Well, I think we should do serve. Friday. I think we should do the serve, right? I'm happy to do the serve. I love the serve. Yeah. Definitely. And the serve is something we can all be working on at home in the garden, shadow swinging. I'll give you loads of drills. I might actually do some live drills on Friday then. That'd be I good. Will, I'll, I'll do some drills so I can show you uh, that they can be done, you know, from a confined space, like a living room or wherever you are. So, yeah, yeah no, definitely. And you, you've actually got your first um, tennis sessions online this week, haven't you, through the clinic. So if people want to get access to those, you can um, just click on the link in the description box below. Um, but it is perfectbalanceclinic.com forward slash online, all one word, online. O-N-L-I-N-E. You sure? Get to plug my bit as well. Excellent. Good stuff. Great. It's been a pleasure talking to you, Rupert. Thank you so much for your time. And I look forward to seeing you again on Friday. See you guys later. Bye-bye. Take care, mate. Bye-bye.